this seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. This seminar is... Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our Healthy You webinar on hernias. At any time during the presentation, you could enter any questions you have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will remain anonymous. Today's presenter is surgeon Dr. Ann Defnet. Dr. Defnet practices with Mather Surgical Associates, a practice of Harborview Medical Services. She joined Harborview from New York University Langone Health, New York, where she worked at Bellevue Hospital Center and Manhattan Veterans Administration Hospital as a general surgery intern and resident and served as a teaching assistant. She is board certified in general surgery and has completed advanced training in minimally invasive surgery. She received her medical degree from the Strict School of Medicine at Loyola University and completed an internship at New York University Langone Health. She completed fellowships in minimally invasive and advanced gastrointestinal surgery at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta and an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation fellowship at the University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital Division of Pediatric Surgery. Dr. Defneth. Hi everyone and thank you so much for joining us. Like Stu said, I'm happy to be talking all about hernias today. So we'll just briefly go over just some basic information about hernias and I look forward to answering all of your questions. So for today, we're gonna talk about what a hernia is, what the different types of hernias are, um, what the risk factors for hernias are, what will you feel if you have a hernia and when should your hernia be fixed? Um, some of the options for fixing hernias, and then what you should expect after hernia repair. So first, what is a hernia? In the very simplest of terms, a hernia is a hole in a bucket, the bucket being your abdominal wall or the muscles and, and stronger tissues that sort of hold all of your intestines and other internal organs in. The hole or hernia allows the contents of the abdomen to bulge through. So what are the different kinds of hernias? There are many different kinds of hernias, but we're gonna talk about basically the most common ones. Um, the most common hernia that we see as surgeons is an inguinal hernia or within the groin. This can uh, include both your standard inguinal hernias and also a femoral hernia. Um, also, we see a lot of umbilical hernias or at your belly button. And then ventral hernias also can be basically anywhere on your abdomen. We see them a lot uh, with incisions. So prior surgeries, you can have a hernia at the site of a prior uh, surgery or any other weak points in the abdominal wall, such as in the epigastric area or spigelian area. So what are the risk factors for having a hernia? So risk factors include old, older age. So your, your muscles and your abdominal wall weakens, which can allow hernias to happen. Also obesity from having increased pressure within your abdominal cavity. Frequent heavy lifting or straining can also predispose you to hernias. Also people may have a family history of hernias. Um, pregnancy or having that stretching of the abdominal wall uh, predisposes some women to hernias as well. And hernias can also just be present in babies at birth that need to be repaired as well. So what will you typically feel if you have a hernia? Everyone is different, but in general, most patients seem to find that they have a bulge where they didn't have a bulge before. They can either feel the bulge or see the bulge, and they may have discomfort or pain near the bulge. Um, some alarm symptoms that we always like to talk about, so things that you should call your doctor about right away, are if you have redness of the skin over the side of your hernia or bulge, if your bulge just won't go back in and your pain is greatly increased, if you have nausea or vomiting, or if you develop fever or chills. These are all symptoms that you should call a doctor for right away. So when should your hernia be fixed? 
So the indications for hernia repair are really person to person. Um, but for most patients, uh, we recommend repairing your hernias if you see that they're increasing in size or they're causing you more pain or discomfort. Also, some patients just can't stand their hernia anymore and want to get it fixed, and that's an absolutely perfect reason to have your hernia fixed as well. Um, having your hernia fixed can become an emergency if you have obstruction, so or from uh, the hernia becoming strangulated or incarcerated or being stuck. Um, this becomes an emergency uh, and we recommend having your hernia repaired immediately. But uh, a really good thing is that all hernias need repair. Some hernias get very, um, very complicated. Um, some hernias aren't annoying. Some hernias people just wanna watch and that's totally fine too. This requires a very thorough discussion with your surgeon. So what are the options for fixing hernias? So there are three typical ways that we fix hernias, and it's really based on a person by person uh, basis, based on what your hernia looks like and also what you want to happen. So the first type of repair is an open repair. Uh, with an open repair, you have a larger incision over the site of the hernia, um, and, but a single incision. With a laparoscopic or robotic repair, you have multiple smaller incisions, usually away from the site of the hernia. Um, and then we can repair your hernia that way. Um, those last two repairs are called minimally invasive techniques. And for specific hernias, we sort of like doing it minimally invasively because you seem to have a better um, recovery after with a little bit less pain. Um, and just a quicker recovery, quicker back to work and everything like that. But of course, uh, depending on what your hernia is like and, and what your preferences are, um, that, that will determine which way we can repair your hernia. So the big question, and I, I, I assume we'll have some questions on this, is mesh or no mesh? Um, everyone has seen those commercials on the television about the issue with mesh. Um, for a lot of hernias actually, and, and you can have a further discussion with your, your personal surgeon, um, it's really important that we use mesh. Mesh is a uh, piece of plastic lace you can see there um, that actually buttresses or, or sort of covers our hernia repair and greatly decreases the risk of recurrence of your hernia or the chance of the hernia coming back. The science behind meshes has really improved over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and the meshes we're using now are, are actually very, very well tolerated by patients. And we're not seeing this type of, of complications that we were seeing 15 to 20 years ago with mesh placement. So again, I know a lot of people have concerns about mesh and it's totally right to be concerned, but I, I do believe in most hernias that we do need to use mesh and you can have a discussion with your surgeon about mesh and, and we can always answer more questions about mesh here as well. So what should you expect after your hernia repair? So most hernia surgeries are day surgeries, meaning you come in in the morning, uh, we perform surgery, you recover from anesthesia and you can go home that same day. Um, Hernia surgery, unfortunately, is a little painful because we have to basically put your abdominal wall back together. So you will have some pain, some swelling, and some bruising. Um, typically, that pain is very well controlled with pain medicines. Um, we, we asked, if you can, that you can take Tylenol and Motrin around the clock. And then we also give you a prescription for narcotic pain medicines that you can use above and beyond. Um, most patients need the narcotic pain medicines for one to two days, um, sometimes a few days more, but typically after that, uh, their, their pain is very well controlled with Tylenol and Motrin. We also recommend ice packs over the side of the hernia, which really actually helps with pain. And we do want you to rest up, but this doesn't mean staying in bed and, and not doing anything, not moving around. Walking is really the best thing you can do after a hernia repair but we do say no heavy lifting more than a gallon of milk or about 10 pounds yes. for six weeks in most cases after uh, oh, oh yeah, it was Dr. Bilal. Yeah, it was Dr. Bilal's procedure. 
So that's about the end of our my presentation to, today. A little bit about us, like uh, Stu said, we're, I'm a part of Mather Surgical Associates. We're right across the street from Mather Hospital. Um, me and my two partners, Dr. Schwartzberg and Dr. Abizad, do the whole gamut of surgery. We do colorectal, general, and other types of surgeries. Um, and we're, we're really uh, ready and available. If you have any questions or concerns, happy to see you and talk to you in, in the clinic. Now we can go to questions. Okay, great. We have some questions coming up here. Uh, I'm having a hernia operation next week. What should I expect for rehab time? Yeah, so everyone is a little different with rehab time after a hernia surgery. It depends on what type of hernia you're having repaired and the, and the method of which you're having repair. For most patients, I say for about a week or two, you'll probably be out of work, meaning you're going to have some pain um, and you probably won't want to go back to work, depending on what you do for work. Obviously, this changes with every person. Um, but I would say most patients want about two weeks off of work. And then after that, they feel okay going to work as long as they're not doing any really heavy lifting at work. Um, we like to make sure that you're not using narcotic pain medicines when you go back to work um, and that your pain is really well controlled. So it's, it's different for everyone. Okay, another question. During an upper GI endoscopy for another issue, issue gastritis, in October 2019, it was determined I had a hiatal hernia. Mm -hmm. I have not had any hernia symptoms before then nor since then and was not advised to have any follow-up. My question is, should I be concerned about this? So hiatal hernias, I didn't really even talk about today, but a hiatal hernia is actually um, a different type of hernia where the top portion of your stomach herniates through a hole in your diaphragm. So that hole has to be there because your esophagus needs to go through it. But sometimes people have um, a little larger hole and their stomach can go up and down. Small hiatal hernias are typically, um, typically not symptomatic. Some patients can find that they have reflux symptoms, which would be a reason to have your hiatal hernia checked out. But right now, the medicines we have for reflux are very, very good. So it's not necessary to get have every hiatal hernia be fixed. Um, so if your gastroenterologist after your upper endoscopy wasn't too concerned about your hiatal hernia and you're not having any symptoms, I would agree that you probably don't need to get it checked out. But for hiatal hernias, the symptoms to worry about are things like reflux, um, dysphagia or inability to swallow, um, and continued gastritis. Another question on hiatal hernias. Uh, this person has one and she's asking, do I need to be on a special diet? So there's no special diet for hiatal hernias. Um, it's just whatever you wanna eat and what you can tolerate. Um, like I said, hiatal hernias do sometimes have a, have sort of a part in reflux symptoms. So for reflux, we, we often recommend you cut out things that are acidic, caffeine, things like that. Um, but if you your reflux don't have reflux and everything is well controlled, there are no diet you know recommendations for a hiatal hernia. Another question, if not mesh, then what is the protocol? Yeah, if not mesh, what do we do? Um, so if we don't use mesh, there are some techniques for repairing hernias where we just use stitches alone. The rate of recurrence, depending on the type of hernia we fix with stitches alone, um, can be up to 10 to even 15% recurrence, meaning the hernia will come back. Um, with mesh, typically that recurrence goes down to between 1% and 3%. So that's why a lot of surgeons, if they recommend that we re they repair your, your hernia with mesh, and you don't want mesh, they might not even do the surgery for you, just because the risk of needing another surgery is a lot higher without that mesh. So without mesh, there are some techniques where we can repair your hernia with just uh, stitches alone. Um, but if a mesh is recommended, it's usually for a very good reason. Okay. Does straining to have a bowel movement aggravate an umbilical hernia? So straining to have any straining can aggravate or make your hernias, as even an umbilical hernia, stick out. Um, I would say it's unlikely that um, straining to have a bowel movement would um, greatly increase the hernia size immediately. Um, but over time, continued straining could increase your umbilical hernia size um, and make it more symptomatic. You might 
uh, appreciate the bulge more, appreciate a bigger bulge, or even uh, have a little more pain associated with it. So yeah, constipation and straining that way can, uh, can affect your hernias. Can a hernia reappear? In other words, can the repair fail? Yes, it can. So recurrence is something that is unfortunately one of the risk factors of having hernia repair. And unfortunately, the more times you try and repair a hernia, the more likely it is to come back. Like I sort of mentioned before, uh, mesh placement does decrease our hernia rate and going to someone who's well-trained in hernia repair also seems to decrease your hernia rate as well. Um, there are some hernias that are just very, very, very hard to repair. These are hernias that are likely incisional in nature that have already attempted repair a few times. Um, so those types of hernias you need to talk to your surgeon about um, and really go through the risks and benefits of having a hernia repair. For inguinal hernias, we do see some recurrences as well. Thankfully, there are multiple ways we can uh, repair inguinal hernias. So typically, if you have uh, a recurrence of an inguinal hernia, that there are normally some other ways we can try and repair it. But yes, recurrence is one of the major risk factors for having a hernia repair, and that recurrence is having your hernia come back. Okay. My husband has COPD. Is there any way to have surgery without being knocked out? So there is actually ways to have surgery without being knocked out. Um, for some hernias, we can do surgery just under local anesthesia. Um, the hernias that are the easiest to sort of fix under local anesthesia are small inguinal hernias, but typically larger inguinal hernias or your larger ventral hernias do require general anesthesia in a breathing tube, which is very difficult in COPD patients. Um, this is because the hole is bigger, the hernia itself is bigger, and we have to really sort of knock you out to make sure that we can fit everything that's bulging out back in. Um, and having you relaxed and having that breathing tube in really helps us make our repair. I have a small umbilical hernia, but no symptoms. I may have had it for a long time, but in my latest physical, the doctor pointed it out. Any advice? So small umbilical hernias, like I said, um, it really is up to you whether you wanna have that fixed. Um, um, a lot of people have umbilical hernias. You know, the umbilicus or belly button is the place that is, you know, the mo most natural side of weakness in our abdominal wall. A lot of people have umbilical hernias and don't even know about it. So if you're not having symptoms from your umbilical hernia, it hasn't gotten any bigger, and you're just not inter interested in surgery right now, that's totally fine. Um, the things to watch out for are if the hernia increases size or, or you become bothered by it. Um, that's a good time to get it checked out again and perhaps see a surgeon and see what your options are. My wife has Barrett's ESOP. She has been on medicine, on PEP, for about two years. Is this too long to be on meds? So PPIs, or what you were talking about, omeprazole, for things like reflux, which causes Barrett's esophagus, are typically okay to be on long term. Um, there have been some studies in mice that have shown some adverse effects from PPIs, but th those have never sort of been found in humans. So in general, I think that a PPI is, is actually a, a very safe medication to be on long term. Um, Barrett's esophagus is something that does need to be followed up um, with uh, upper endoscopy by your gastroenterologist. Um, but hopefully the omeprazole should, should help in, in letting your um, esophagus repair and, and knocking down that reflux. Um, so personally, I believe that a PPI is an okay medicine to be on for a long period of time. Um, they work very well. That's just a discussion you need to have with your primary care doctor and also your gastroenterologist. What causes a hiatal hernia? So like I had sort of talked about a little bit before, a hiatal hernia is through the defect in the diaphragm that the esophagus usually um, courses through um, to get to your stomach. Sometimes that, uh, that defect or the hiatus um, in the diaphragm can enlarge and allow part of the stomach to, um, to go into the chest. Um, that can have varying degrees, but, but typically the, the 
the risk factors for a hiatal hernia are pretty similar to your risk factors for other hernias. Um, having an increased, uh, increased weight or obesity or that increased pressure in your abdominal cavity can cause hiatal hernias, or they can just be congenital, meaning like your, your hiatus or that hole in the diaphragm is just a little bigger and allows a piece of your stomach to go up. Some people have very, very large hiatal hernias, we call parasophageal hernias, where their entire stomach can be in their chest. That typically is something that has to do with age and thinning of the diaphragm muscle, as well as just having sort of a congenital uh, larger hiatus. Um, so those are some of the risk factors for a hiatal hernia. I had an incarcerated inguinal hernia six years ago, which was repaired with mesh. Unfortunately, I picked up C. diff during my hospital stay and became very ill. Now the hernia is back, but I'm afraid to go back to a hospital for another repair and get exposed to C. diff. What would you suggest? So unfortunately, I'm sorry about your course. That is a, a, an atypical, but we do see that happen. Um, C. diff is one of those bugs that some people are prone to. And when we do hernia surgery, we do give you a dose of antibiotics um, just to sort of fight against the hernia itself getting infected when we do the surgery. Um, this would be a, a good question to talk to a surgeon about and see what we can do. But typically, um, we just watch you very carefully. If we are repairing your um, hernia in an elective um, fashion, so it's not incarcerated, you're not having to stay in the hospital, the chances of you uh, getting C. diff afterwards are, are much smaller because you're not being exposed to the hospital setting where, where patients unfortunately can be exposed to C. diff. Um, but that is a, a legitimate concern to have, especially since you had it so rough last time. Um, but definitely talk to your surgeon about ways that we can try to, to decrease that from happening again. How much experience is needed for closed hernia surgery? Uh, I assume you're talking about uh, robotic or... Yeah, so I think that uh, this day and age, a lot of people are being trained in laparoscopic and robotic hernia surgery. Uh, I do think that those surgeries, you do need to have a good training in it. I, uh, I was trained in it, so I feel very comfortable doing um, laparoscopic and robotic hernia surgery. Um, but typically the robotic and laparoscopic platforms uh, once you know how to fix a hernia, once you know how to use those platforms, uh, most surgeons feel pretty comfortable doing it that way. So it's really just up to you talking to your surgeon about what they feel comfortable doing with your particular hernia. Um, I don't have like a number of surgeries that each surgeon should do personally um, in order to feel comfortable with that, uh, with each individual method of fixing a hernia. But I do feel that uh, surgeons that have had a little more training and laparoscopic and robotic techniques are likely to give you that option. Okay. Uh, looking for any others. How long after surgery can you drive? So driving is one of those things that everyone is a little bit different. The main thing I say for my patients for driving after surgery is to make sure you're not taking any of the narcotic pain medicines anymore. Also, I like patients to do a little test drive, maybe around the block, see how they're feeling. It's really important that you're able to slam on the brake or quickly turn, look and turn over your shoulder without having too much pain. Um, so it, I think a nice drive around the block to start out uh, usually can tell you if you're feeling up to driving. Um, but it, it's really dependent on, on every patient and when they're not using those pain medicines and when they feel comfortable enough to slam on the brake. Okay. Another question, in abdominal hernia, are you familiar with the use of Botox, also a plastic surgeon use? Yeah, so for very large abdominal hernias, um, the use of Botox um, is actually very helpful and allowing us to achieve what we call primary closure or bringing the actual wall of your abdomen back together and being able to sew it up without tension. Um, Botox, um, as you may or may not know, is a drug that sort of uh, denervates and relaxes your muscles. 
So if we give Botox to specific levels of the abdominal wall, that can relax your that can relax your abdominal muscles and allow us to um, bring your hernia or bring the bring the edges of your abdominal wall back together. Uh, so Botox is used in very large and complicated hernias. Um, and has been used with some success. Um, it is, is a newer treatment for larger hernias to help us. And it's not a treatment itself for hernias. It just helps us fix the hernia. Okay, I think that's it on the questions. If anyone else has any other questions, you can uh, add them now to the Q&A feature. And if not, I just want to thank Dr. Defnet for her presentation. Uh, if you did not get your question answered or you think of a question afterwards, you can email us at Mather Hospital, one word, at northwell.edu, and we will pass your questions on to uh, Dr. Defnet. Once you exit the webinar, you'll be redirected to complete a brief survey. We'd appreciate it if you can complete the survey. Your feedback is very important to us and helps us plan future webinars. If you would like to view any other Healthy You webinars that we have presented, you can find them all at matherhospital.org slash healthy you. Again, thank you, Dr. Defnet, and thanks everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.